Hello and welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nandia. Today, we take up this two-part series on the issue of arbitration. And namely, this judgment, which was authored by this bench, which comprises of Chief Justice of India, Justice Dhananjay Chandrachur, Justice uh, P.S. Narsimha, and Justice Padiwala. They reiterated the principle here that arbitration award cannot be set aside on mere possibility of an alternative view of facts of interpretation of contract. Now here the question becomes very important that the highest court in the land has to get into uh, this well-known principle and send a message across. Uh, why is this important in a growing economy which will see billions of dollars of investment to become a $5 trillion economy which will result in disputes running into huge amounts? Uh, if everything lines up at the Supreme Court, then can this idea of huge investment coming to India be realized? Because every investor look at uh, the enforcement of contracts data for every country. That's why the message sent by the Supreme Court and the three judges is very important. Uh, I'll introduce you to my panel today. Uh, I have with me uh, Simran Brar. She is a partner with Karajawala and Company. Good to see you on the show after a while. And looking Hi. for some interesting insights. Hi. I have with me senior advocate Percival Billimoria, who's a well-known arbitrator, also appears at the Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court of India. I have with me senior advocate Arvind Nair, who is an arbitrator. He also appears at NCLAT, NCLAT's uh, Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court of India. Uh, he will also give us a peek into this whole issue in detail. At the outset, let me go to senior advocate Percival Billimoria. That in the first two minutes, if you could uh, uh, lay a few points which you feel are key to the arbitration landscape in India and how it should develop, keeping in mind the roadblocks that we keep on facing. Delay in execution of awards being one. Second, this issue that the courts want to do justice. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they get into various social aspects also what is right, rather than just going by hard-nosed commercial decisions, what business decisions are to be. Your comment on this. So, Tarun, you are very right that, in fact, the law was amended way back in 2015. But I have to tell you that even if you look at decisions under the old Act, the 1940 Act, uh, the principle was clearly laid down that you cannot interfere with the award of an arbitrator lightly. In fact, uh, but there is a decision, uh, Sudarshan Trading, which lays down precisely this principle, which is that where two views are possible, the court will not interfere. Uh, then, uh, of course, your Rashtriya is packed, which said that if two views are possible, even if not plausible. And then there are two, three other decisions that say that if the view is plausible, there is no need for the court to intervene. The only way that the court can intervene is if you argue and substantiate that argument that the, that the award is perverse. Now, what is interesting in this decision is uh, they have actually gone into this perversity because please be mindful of the fact that what the other counterparty argued is that the arbitrator had actually rewritten the contract. Now, one of the other truisms about arbitration is that an arbitrator has to go by the contract. Now, the question is, can you rewrite the contract in an arbitration award? So, th therefore, this makes, although this reiterate the same principle, that there can be no review on merits. This, in a way, uh, decides the issue once and for all as to whether what is the jurisprudence on the point Ultimately, there can be no review on merits. It is embedded in the law since 2015. There were several decisions even before and many more decisions following that uh, amendment to the law. But there are sometimes conflicting situations that a court is faced with. And I think this decision lays down this very important point, which is that when there are two uh, situations, there are two opinions, the court will not interfere which is absolutely consistent with the law. But I had just one uh, issue here, which is, having said this, the bench has, in fact, itself said 
that uh, it says here that we have examined the appreciation of evidence by the tribunal and we are convinced that it is reasonable. So the issue that really happens is this kind of observation sometimes leaves the door open for somebody to next time argue that, look, this decision is based only on this premise, that they examined this and that found it to be reasonable, which is not the case based on facts and merits in my situation. So that is how uh, the you know the difficult juridic, uh, jurisprudence that you're talking about gets established. I think it would have been excellent if they had just reiterated the principle, uh, but I think this particular observation in a way uh, leaves the door open once again. And okay. this is the problem. Please go ahead. You see, the, the way the judgments are written, I think is a very important issue because we have a lot of uh, excellent practitioners and anything written in the judgment is seized upon to say, well, this does not apply in my situation. I think that's the one thing that uh, we should just be mindful of. Otherwise, it's an excellent judgment and it reiterates the well-established time-tested principle. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the opening comment. I go to Simran, the partner, yes. Karanjavala and company. Now, when you look at the arbitration practice, in India, there is an arbitration bar largely consisting of retired judges. Uh, now, when uh, current judges sit in judgment of arbitral awards given by retired judges, uh, it is a sort of a situation which is a bit tricky here. It is entirely different that lawyers, if lawyers would be 90% of the arbitration bar, there is an arbit. We have eminent judges as arbitrators. Even then, if judges want to go into and say do justice. I mean, when you do justice in a commercial decision, then sometimes awards may look entirely wrong to you uh, from the justice perspective. But from the commercial perspective, they may be absolutely right because commercial decisions can go wrong and you have to pay a price for it. Uh, can you give me a detailed uh, intervention on this? Issue? Right. So if I understand correctly, Tarun, you are uh, <clears throat> wanting me to uh, talk about the arbitration aspect of things, how they... So, you know, I think it's both ways. One, like you spoke about doing justice versus the commercial contract. And uh, of course, in many of these uh, cases, the arbitra or many of them are very, of course, they are all competent judges and arbitrators. The difficulty that arises is that sometimes a contract has to be interpreted. Of course, it has to be construed strictly as we know a commercial contract. But there are times that, you know, particularly, I'm not going to cite the case, but there has been a case of ours, which is very identical to the situation at hand, where the contract had a certain ambiguity for which, you know, something had to be interpreted, um, say, taking other principles into account, you know, the PENTA test, etc. Now, in that case, what happens is that if, a, you know, in the 34, a judge is to hold that. Now, there are two possible views. One can be that you strictly go by where the, how the contract is, and the other is you give a you know holistic um, overview and a finding to that dispute. Now, this is exactly where the problem I think arises, which this judgment also leaves it um, you know at large, is that the the point that um, what is two possible views in thirty four several judges find it that find it to be that. One possible view is as if it's rewriting of a contract. So what are arbitrators to do? The question is that you have to ultimately clarify that what two possible views and a plausible view. You have to view possible and plausible, construe it together. Now that the judgments have come, there's Atlanta, Diana, all of these. But the arbitrators ultimately are doing what they have to do. They appreciate the evidence and all of that. But uh, I think this judgment leaves that at large that there is no way to say that what is called rewriting of a contract. It's a very fine line. So I think that that aspect needs to still be clarified. Okay, I'll take this to senior advocate Arvind Nair. Now, when you do uh, cases in NCLT and NCLAT, uh, do you come across this aspect uh, that arbitration award money not received, company goes into insolvency. 
uh, their future hinges on the arbitral awards which they had to receive the enforcement of these awards enforcement not happened company admitted to ibc do you think this is a serious issue in the indian business and arbitration landscape in fact tarun uh, i must point out let me just start with saying that what the judgment has done is only reiterated a principle which we all knew which was that please don't interfere in an arbitration award if an alternative view is possible from a business perspective and from the perspective let me even though you didn't mention it but let me just bring that in india's position in the whole arbitration universe also the biggest complaint or if i may use the word gripe or negative feedback that we have at, which i think stands in the way of india becoming an arbitration hub is the time arbitral proceedings take here and i think that is uh, that is one reason why the honorable supreme court is reiterated which we have always known that please don't interfere if an alternative view is possible you're absolutely right now with nclt and nclat proceedings being so uh, time bound and so strict and repercussions being sort of irreversible if arbitral awards are not going to be executed within a certain period of time then it can actually lead to a lot of distress for a company which is irreversible so that's one part of it and the other is as i said india is standing in the arbitral uh, universe and in that atmosphere so as far as i am concerned i think this was the need of the uh, this reiteration of the principle and uh, my friend uh, percy mentioned about evidence my own view is uh, that actually it's the arbitral tribunal which is master of the evidence so really as far as section 34 and 37 is concerned i think where it's coming down to is it's eventually it's narrowing down to the fact that when you are sitting in that jurisdiction please only look at the writing of the award just test how articulate the award is and if it's backed by reasons because if you start going into evidence then then you are entering into that other realm which is still not absolutely you know decided and the other thing which simran said correctly is that there is a very fine dividing line as to what would amount to rewriting the contract and what what would amount to a possible view that's a very very fine line and i think that is something which eventually comes down to individual discretion of a bench you know every bench is when when they read the reasoning of the award every bench looks at it differently a, a bench may look at it and think that look this is perverse this is manifestly perverse this is arbitrary this this interpretation is something which which does not which is not consistent could not have been taken and another bench may feel it's a view and why when you're looking at views in a contract it's not only two views it could be four views it could be six views so i think we have to where we are probably leading to is that only look at the award how it's worded whether it's well reasoned whether it's articulate enough is there anything that shows that it's not reasoned i think th that is where we are eventually leading to if we have to fine tune the pace at which our arbitral proceedings conclude th that that's my view So okay, more. point point very well taken. I'll go to Persimmon Billimoria on this. Respecting finality of the award uh, is important from the point of view of commercial prudence. Uh, do you think if you forever go into things, uh, in a sense, India's attractiveness as an investment destination gets affected? A. Secondly, you're looking at a hundred and fifty billion dollar infrastructure uh, investment into India. this will give rise to disputes more than we ever imagined in india in the arbitration landscape most infrastructure cases end up in arbitration that's the preferred mode for dispute resolution be that as it may uh, if many of these infrastructure companies end up with paper awards uh, uh, do you think it is a, it is in a sense a terrible scenario for the future secondly if you could go into the aspect whether india's arbitration and court system is ready uh, to deal with this huge influx of cases that we will face uh, in the next uh, say about 5 to 7 years are we ready to tackle and address and deliver on this front so uh, tarun i disagree on one aspect it is not about commercial prudence or not see the legal theory the legal philosophy behind uh, what all of us are saying which is that arbitration awards should be final has a different origin it originates from the fact that 
arbitration is a consensual process. So once you have agreed that your disputes will be resolved by an arbitrator, then there should be minimum court interference. That's the legal theory. Now, it just so happens that we are talking about commercial arbitration. I mean, there are non-commercial arbitrations also. Marital disputes, for example, can be arbitrated. Uh, if you have a prenup, for example, which has an arbitration agreement. But commercial con contracts are largely, uh, large part of the arbitration uh, jurisprudence is the commercial. So to that extent, the origin of the uh, issue that you are stating is a little different. As far as uh, the finality of awards are concerned, I have always had the view that yes, the current law, which is what we are concerned in and which is what should drive the courts as well as the practitioners, is very clear on the fact that you, you cannot overturn an arbitration award lightly unless all the conditions specified in 34 subsection 2 are satisfied. And those conditions are very limited. And as I said, the law has been amended recently to provide that there'll be no reappreciation on merits of the case or no reappreciation of evidence. Now, the only question that I'm posing to you is this is a very good regime to resolve commercial disputes. But the problem is, what is the quality of the arbitration institutions that control this? This is the whole issue. Because from a commercial point of view, if you're a businessman, would you like to, suppose you are at the rough end of the stick and you have suffered an award which you vigorously believe that this is wrong and in, unjust. Now, of course, no litigant is ever happy with uh, any court decision or any award. Uh, but there are times when there is an award which is completely perverse. That needs to be overturned. Because as a businessman, just as you would want uh, an award in your favor to be enforced, there is the other side also that you must consider that if you have support, suffered an award, which you believe is unjust and perverse, then it must be struck down. But it cannot be struck down lightly without consideration of the statutory provisions, which clearly say that you cannot second guess. So the court cannot sit in the place of an arbitrator and decide that if I was the arbitrator, this is what I would say is the correct view. That's the key. You cannot uh, substitute yourself. It is not an appeal. The jurisprudence is different. It is not an appellate jurisprudence. So the issue really is that when you decide that arbitration is the resolution of disputes, you are electing a very different jurisprudence. And I think businessmen should be aware of this. Point well taken. Uh, uh, that brings us to the end of part one. I would like to thank Senior Advocate Percival Villiboria. Simran Bar partner, Karajamala and company, senior advocate Arun Nayar, uh, uh, they brought in their own word to the discussion, uh, uh, brought in some interesting insights. Uh, of course, uh, we will uh, request their time when we record on time, cost and delay in arbitration in India, which is a big issue uh, uh, next month. But that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining me today on this discussion. And viewers, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If they are not See, aware of this, then... No, but you made a very interesting point that the judges uh, hearing uh, an appeal, uh, they're not sitting in appeal when they hear this application. Uh, I'll take this to senior advocate Arvind Nair. Do you think the judges need to be trained, uh, say, at the Bhopal Academy, to send a strong message on how arbitral appeals have to be viewed by the courts of law? Uh, See, many of these judges, they are on the, you know, they are on the civil roster, then they go on the criminal roster, then they find themselves uh, doing uh, uh, these kind of appeals. Uh, do you think a training would go a long way in solving the dilemma that the businesses face? Because you never know where on whose judge is, you know, bench your case lands up. And that keeps you in a dilemma. Uh, Tarun, you, uh, you raised a valid point about training, but training, I feel, is only one aspect of it. Uh, I would connect this to uh, one of my uh, you know, favorite topics here. I think what happens is uh, training, I'm not sure training can entirely eliminate a judge's discretion on, on how to hear a matter or how to hear a challenge to an 
arbitral award because even in appeals, uh, Percy said it's not an appeal. Of course, it's not an appeal. But even in appeals, you will find that different judges, notwithstanding uh, so much of settled law, different judges approach hearing of appeals in a different manner. What is often happening, what we observe on the ground in a Section 34 petition is that it's also the weight of numbers and the paucity of time that takes away from hearing a 34 and deciding it on the first hearing, whether there should be interference in it at all or not, whether it warrants interference or not. You know what happens? You come to the high court or uh, before a, before the trial court in a section 34 petition, you are challenging a 100 page or an 80 page or a 140 page award. And you start reading extracts from it to point out to the court that look, this is where this part is perverse, that part is arbitrary, this is not supported by the clauses of the contract. It's also that weight of numbers that creeps in. And, and, and that is a problem, uh, you know, where which we are seeing in every jurisdiction for that matter. So, you know, once you once you cross 20 minutes, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, it's natural instinct where, uh, you know, it, it's not, our constitutional courts, I think somebody recently commented, uh, gave a comparison between how many cases the U.S. Supreme Court has and how many cases the Indian Supreme Court has. Our constitutional courts are actually people's courts, citizens' courts. They have so many cases that I think there is that training by instinct that you know once you uh, once you are looking at something and you you it, it's taken thirty minutes, forty minutes. You 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 do tend to say that uh, you know let's examine it. This may call for examination, but I think. Uh, over a period of time, training, of course, is not a bad idea. In fact, there are a lot of seminars happening. And in fact, several sitting and retired judges of the Supreme Court, as well as chief justices of the high courts have also recommended training. So I think training will go a long way. We are also seeing one another welcome development, which is a lot of seminars and conferences that are exclusively connected to arbitration, where also this feedback that, look, you have to be cognizant and mindful of the time that a proceeding takes is also repeatedly coming up. So I think it's, it's. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, let's say over the last decade, and I'm sure uh, Percy and Simran will agree with me, it's it's become relatively more difficult to get notice issued in a section 34 petition. So there is some progress. It's, it's not perhaps as fast as all of us would like it to be as uh, practitioners of arbitration and commercial law, but there is progress there. I think uh, Percy wants to say something, so yeah, let him... Just, to, uh, just a small corollary. You see, uh, in this case, the division bench relied on a 1959 civil suit. So I think that is where, uh, and I think the you know Supreme Court has rightly pointed out that uh, this was wrong. But uh, the reason why something like this goes back and forth is uh, there are no clear guidelines. So for example, when you say perversity, what is perverse? So there continues to be and will continue to be judicial debate and it will be left to the discretion ultimately yes. of, of the bench to decide this thing. I think uh, Simran's input will be very valuable yeah. because there's so a part I'll of... I'll tell you, I'll go to... Uh, uh, I'll, 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 one short question, then I'll come to Simran. Uh, uh, you have experts who stand in as assisting the arbitration uh, panel on, uh, uh, you know, before uh, the awards are decided... In many uh, construction contract cases, hot topic is that where the evidence is recorded. Even after that, if the court interferes, do you think that this uh, uh, leaves the clients and the parties involved in a big dilemma? See, when you talk about expert evidence, I mean, I can tell you that Indian arbitration tribunals uh, are very skeptical about expert evidence because they are seen as hired guns. So unlike uh, in uh, international arbitrations where expert uh, views, are also there are some sophisticated techniques like hot tubbing, etc., which is if both parties have an expert, you put both of them together yeah. and then let them sort it out in front of the tribunal because that way you get a better understanding of what's happening. So I think our procedures uh, that we follow in arbitration also not evolved uh, to a large extent. Now, Simran, both the senior uh, advocates have spoken. Now, give me a law from you for two things. Uh, now, you head the arbitration practice at Taranjawala, so you have a client interface. Uh, when yeah. you have a client interface, uh, he doesn't want to know a lot of what is happening inside the court after the award has been pronounced. He has a question mark on his face. 
that I have an mm-hmm. award in my hand and I am running from pillar to post. The execution isn't happening. Uh, and now the Supreme Court has given a strong message. Could you tie up all the uh, loose ends and tell me what are the possible solutions to go in the right direction? Right. I think uh, one is uh, the solution, like not a solution, but some change in view that we've already seen. Of course, there's a reiteration by the Supreme Court, but like Mr. Nair said, the courts are already becoming stricter and stricter in issuing notice in 34s. There is absolutely no doubt about that. I mean, I have personally seen a change over the last five to seven years, ever since it's boomed more and more. And I think this will continue. But to tell a client that if, You know, sometimes even if you have an award in your favor, and unfortunately, you still can't be 100% sure because naturally the other party is going to take the standard uh, defenses, you know, of that rewriting of a contract and that this was never a possible view and all of that. So I see the one other thing is that in addition to, like you suggested, training of judges, I think also... uh, there would also be a certain requirement at the arbitral tri- arbitrator's level. You know, some more, I think, training, if it's institutionalized, of even arbitrators. I, you know why I say that with utmost respect to all arbitrators, and I don't say it about all. But, you know, like you rightly put it, there are arbitrators who are coming from, you know, maybe not necessarily a very commercial side of things in the last five to seven years of, you know, when they retire, before they retire. So I think it's not a bad idea to go back to that because it's an original suit kind of a format, which is an arbitration. So that is one thing which I feel that arbitrators also need some training. And there's no harm in going back and reskilling, like we say, you know. So I don't know, Mr. Nair, if he agrees with me on that, but uh, something to that extent also oh, would go along. I absolutely agree, because as Simran said, and... Uh... I think we both know <laughs> what we may be thinking about or who we may be thinking about. Yes. But she's right. There are some very distinguished judges who come from a jurisdiction where they've only done, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil law. They they really have not sort of uh, been exposed that much to a commercial matter. So there therein lies the problem. So training, of course, it, it's a it, it's never none of us is ever too old or experienced to go back to the drawing board. At the end of the day, we are all students of the law. So. I think that's a that's a good suggestion. Secondly, Simran, I also want to ask you that uh, uh, enforcement of contracts has become a big issue. Mainly, arbitration awards uh, comprise a huge uh, piece of this puzzle. That uh, getting anything enforced in India, you know, there are a thousand ways you can delay enforcement. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court can do something more in this or do you think it's too tricky or too troublesome to solve this puzzle? I think it's difficult for the Supreme Court to really sort this because, you know, enforcement really happens at at the state level. You know, you're, I mean, in the sense it's the high courts or the trial court or with the executing court. I mean, yes, sending down a message by, by way of such, so many now landmark judgments where executions are going on and things like that. But at the end of the day, executing an award is really in the hands of, I mean, the executing court, like I said, and they need to take a strict stand. And I think they are increasingly. I mean, uh, I think foreign awards, yes, those are a little problematic. But otherwise, it's, I mean, we we are in a better situation than we were. So I would like to think that we are not in a very, I have a very quick question before I go to Percival Billimoria. In say a lot of cases against government PSUs or against the government per se, delay results in the interest cost becoming say 70%, 80% of the award cost. So if your 100 crore award and your interest becomes 70 crore, the government is not keen to pay. Uh, do you think it's now in the government's interest also? Uh, so do, what can be done to solve this dilemma where the interest and you know if somebody gets Say 100 crore, if he had to get in 2015, he gets in 23, 8 years later, the money loses its value. The company may Hmm. go into IBC, the vendors may not be Hmm. paid, the employees may go uh, hungry. Can you solve this puzzle? I am not entirely sure. I think there was some notification which had, uh, I'm not sure if it's notified, but I had read this about last year where there was some mechanism uh, that the government had come out with with regard to 
uh, you know, some kind of a settlement where, uh, you know, there's this interest component running and things like that. But to be honest, I haven't uh, looked it up in the recent past. And I think the government was looking into it. Maybe, I mean, you know, I can look it up and let you know on another occasion. But uh, yes, certainly, because certainly. everything becomes, uh, yes, yes. So it needs to be resolved because ultimately with that kind of interest clocking up, it's it's not going to, um, you know, make That's sense. Problem. Problem. I yeah. take this to, if I, uh, Arvind wants to come in, then Percival will be in. Arun, I just wanted to point out, uh, since you mentioned the IBC, in fact, uh, you know, in Section 7, financial creditor files an application, there is no discretion. The Supreme Court, in fact, did take note of these kind of situations in the Vidharba judgment. You know, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court in Vidharba said that uh, NCLT does have a discretion in the given facts of a case to not proceed and or to not admit a Section 7. And the facts of Vidharba were that the corporate debtor in that case had an arbitration award in its favor and was actually awaiting satisfaction and execution of that award. So it's not as if the Honorable Supreme Court has not been mindful of this. Even though now there was a review and the review said that Vidharba and there is another now there is another judgment uh, which says that Vidharba was on the facts of that case. But in given cases, the NCLTs and even the appellate tribunal have been quoting Vidharba to say that, you know, if a company has an arbitral record in uh, award in its favor and that's to be executed, that does mean that it is actually a solvent company and should not go into CIRP. So that is something that the Supreme Court's already taken note of. Okay, point, point. Building. There's also one more thing that, that I wanted to say, Tarun, which is that now, increasingly, when the courts, high courts, etc., grants stay in a 34, they also, if not on the first day, then I've seen now parties moving applications wherein they also ask the, uh, you know, a deposit of interest, you know, at least some deposit of the interest component as well. So it's getting strict, it's getting harsh, but we need to see where we are really going to take this. Okay. Point well taken. I'll go to Percival Vinayaraya. For example, in infrastructure cases, uh, do you think that uh, paying money to uh, the one who has the arbitral award in his hand and then putting uh, the rest in an escrow is the solution and do courts exercise it often enough? So the law clearly says that uh, the award is equivalent to a suit. It's not a suit. Uh, it's, it's not a decree, but it is uh, deemed to be a decree. So okay. uh, what that means is that it is a money decree. And when you enforce, uh, when you are challenging a money decree, then you have to deposit a large part, a substantial part of the sum due under the decree uh, before the court. So that is already done. In a way, the, sometimes uh, if the amount is not very large, they ask for 100%. Deposit and if the amount amount is larger, the trend that I've seen, you know, the percentage of deposit is lower. So that I think is already being done, and uh, I think as uh, both my co-panelists have said that the situation has improved dramatically. It is not as bad as it was, I would say, about twenty years ago. It has improved dramatically, okay. and the courts are now very aware of this problem, and they are uh, disposing. In fact, in I think, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to enforcing foreign awards, the Supreme Court is very quick in dealing with it because they don't give too much credence to some of the uh, some of the arguments that are put forward. And it's certainly, if you look at the timeline that is now uh, the norm, it is certainly a little shorter. Of course, it is impacted by the pendency of cases. That's a separate issue. But in terms of the number of hearings that it will require, for uh, enforcement of a foreign award to be set aside uh, by the Supreme Court. And the number of foreign awards which are not enforced, uh, that percentage of statistics itself will show you that it is minuscule. So I don't think it is as big a problem. I think the problem lies elsewhere. The problem is we need to have very good mature institutions <clears throat> because when you have institutions, then uh, you know, they have uh, stuff like peer review of awards and checks and balances. There is a particular procedure that is laid down. Uh, you know, so for example, evidence taking. Now, a civil uh, justice who is retired and used to civil court proceedings <clears throat> will follow very elaborate procedure for taking of evidence. <clears throat> Whereas in an institution also, <clears throat> they do not have rules of evidence set up. 
but there are the IBA rules. Now, in an Indian arbitration, <clears throat> these are only recommendatory. You can't enforce uh, IBA rules. You can't tell the uh, arbitrator to necessarily follow them. So th there is a little bit of <clears throat> framework of the background of our procedural laws that need to change. I think the law as it is, uh, in terms of the statute as to when you can uh, challenge an award and when a foreign award can be enforced is pretty robust. It is the second substrata, the procedural regulations uh, that need to be uh, taken care of. Uh, we'll now move on to a round of closing comments. So we'll start with Simran. What is the Supreme Court practice? Your closing comment for today. Yes, I think this judgment is good in terms that it, I would say it is more of a reminder to the 34 courts more than, you know, uh, lawyers, because as lawyers, we understand this as practitioners of this practice. But it is a reminder to the courts and to the 34 judges, uh, judges sitting in section 34, that it needs to be construed strictly when there are two views and not to loosely say, which, you know, one comes across that it is simply a rewriting of contract. And that's how I feel that 34, 37 courts tend to, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, get out of this two possible views thing. And they say, no, no, it's not two possible views. This is rewriting. So I can set aside this award. Point well taken. Arvind Nayar, senior advocate, your uh, uh, comments on what message the bench of Justice Chandrachur, Justice Pardiwala, Justice Narsiba, or to what point they're trying to drive? I think agreeing with Simran, uh, this is a reiteration of what we always knew, but this is reiteration, uh, putting it beyond doubt and actually just raising the bar for Section 34 petitions. I, I think that's what it is. And I think we'll see more such uh, reiterations because uh, I think the Honorable Supreme Court is very mindful of how uh, this is looked on, whether it's from an investment perspective, whether it's from a perspective of India becoming an arbitration hub, whether it's... Uh, just that, just that fundamental principle that why should you be able to delay a proceeding where you chose the dispute resolution mechanism? That's why it's called ADR. So I think that's what it is. Point, point, when taken. Senior advocate Percival Billimaria, your closing comment. So I reiterate exactly what uh, my co panelists have said. It, it's a very good judgment and it reiterates and rightly so. But again, uh, you know, just a very quick uh, reaction to. Uh, insolvency, right? I mean, look, in, uh, uh, I mean, not in, if, if you go to the NCLAT, for example, in a dispute on operation and mismanagement. Now, there, uh, it depends on whether you follow Indian law. So, if it's an Indian seated arbitration or if it is a foreign seated arbitration, then you have to look at whether that jurisdiction allows operation and mismanagement to be an issue. So, for example, in Singapore, a dispute which is on operation and mismanagement can be arbitrated because the seat is Singapore and that country allows operation and mismanagement to be an arbitration issue. Whereas here, we have NCLT and it's a company law issue, so NCLT leaves it in. Of course, the release that an NCLT can give under a company law are much more extensive than a tribunal can give. So there are certain inconsistencies on, on this aspect also, because if you are a litigant uh, seeking relief for operation and mismanagement, you certainly prefer NCLT because the act empowers them to even say that, okay, you are no longer a director or, or to uh, some very dramatic uh, uh, remedies can be sought, which an arbitrator will never be able to give. So these point, are point, point. structural issues that we have to think about. I think beyond that, uh, it's moving in the right direction. And uh, let's not push it too far because sometimes the pendulum can swing the other way. Okay. Point well taken. Uh, uh, that brings us to the end of part one. I would like to thank Senior Advocate Percival Villimoria, Simran Bar Partner, Karajamala and Company, Senior Advocate Arun Nair. Uh, uh, they brought in their own word to the discussion. Uh, uh, brought in some interesting insights. Uh, of course, uh, we will uh, request their time when we record on time, cost and delay in arbitration in India, which is a big issue uh, uh, next month. But that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining me today on this discussion. And viewers, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.